Good afternoon, or in the case of our next speaker, uh, a very good morning. Uh, thank you for joining us again. Um, welcome to the Automotive EV Live conference. As I've discussed before, the, the conference is over the next five days, and uh, each day we will have a number of uh, keynotes or standalone speakers, uh, panel discussions, presentations, and I'm new to the uh, the conference arena for us, a number of startup uh, presentations throughout the next week. So uh, without sort of uh, any further delay, I would like you to introduce you to uh, Jonathan, um, who is uh, over in uh, North California, and uh, he's kindly brought us great weather, so that's good. And so uh, over to you, uh, Jonathan, and then we'll have a chat uh, once you've completed and ask, answer any questions on whatever that... Uh, get uh, directed to us, so thank you. Great, uh, thank you so much, uh, Peter, for the invitation and for the honor of being able to speak with your audience today. Uh, I, I am passionate about the automotive space and uh, as cars have become you know, more computer than anything, uh, it's, it's particularly appealed to me uh, and um, as a person who is super focused on uh, smart cities, uh, there's no separation now between cars, you know, transportation in general, and our city environment. So I'm, I'm delighted to be part of your event, and hopefully I can share some valuable insights. The particular angle I'm going to take on my little uh, short talk today is <clears throat> what it means to have uh, you, you, emerging and evolving car innovation during this new fourth industrial revolution. <clears throat> so that's really what I want to talk about. And, and to be able to talk about that and uh, share sort of what that means to car manufacturers, car retailers, car purchases, transportation users, we have to look at what the fourth industrial revolution is. So we'll do that first, and then I'll talk about uh, transportation and um, some of the emerging trends within uh, transportation. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, have the presentation brought up here. Great. Um, so what I'd like to do is take you on a little history lesson uh, through the, the prior three industrial revolutions, and we'll set the context for the new time in which we live. And by the way, if you, you, some of the things I talk about specifically uh, to do with uh, automotive, if this is very familiar to you, what might be interesting is how the fourth industrial revolution may impact and be a, a, a broader catalyst to greater change overall in society. So hopefully that'll be interesting to you too. You know, the first industrial revolution you know, comes out of the UK, comes out of Britain, uh, back in the 1700s, and it's really defined by the utilization of steam, right? Steam for movement. You know this from your from your school days. It's also about the uh, production of steel for the first time, so we could do uh, things like build uh, stronger, better uh, machines and, and and bridges and and, and railways. And, and railways were were hugely transformational. For, for moving people. Not long after, uh, well, you know, about less than 100 years ago, we, we transitioned into the second industrial revolution. And uh, this was even bigger and greater in its impact. Uh, one of the core defining characteristics uh, was uh, humans leveraging electricity, right? the world changed overnight from a world without electricity to a world that started to bring on the use of electricity in, in every aspect of life. And it's an interesting thing because this started in the, in the 1800s and you know, quickly among the first industrial nations, electricity began to be rolled out to communities. But the project to electrify the world isn't finished yet, it isn't finished. There's still a little less than a billion human beings on the planet right now today who don't have access to electricity. So it started in the 1800s and it's still underway. Now that's a big project, right? But no one can doubt 
the significant impact of electricity. We couldn't do anything uh, pretty much that we do today, including a conference like this without electricity. You know, it, 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 it created mass production and it really triggered the huge urban um, movement of, of building bigger uh, cities. Also gave way to things like the, the telegraph and then the, the telephone. Um, so uh, it, it's still a miracle that we can leverage it and, and it's really transformed uh, humanity. Now fast forward from the 1800s to about 1950. In fact, let's look at 1958. Something happened in 1958 that absolutely has changed the world and continues to change the world. Well, it all started with an event in 1958, uh, Sputnik. Sputnik was a satellite that was launched. It was the first satellite launched from uh, the Soviet Union at the time. And it traveled uh, around the world. Uh, in particular, it traveled over the United States. And it was not a good day when a Russian satellite was over the mainland of the U.S. Um, it was really sort of the, we were getting to the heart of the Cold War. And the idea that the, the Russians could look down and peer into the backyards of, of Americans was uh, enough to give chills and, and really change the course of history. America knew that nothing would be the same again, and, 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 and we would have to have our own satellites and defense against the satellites. And, and so a massive national effort was started to um, launch our own rockets and our own satellite technology. And, and some of that um, involved investing in uh, new miniaturization technology. Um, and in fact, a um, lot of money flowed from the federal government into the west coast of the United States, particularly around the San Jose and Palo Alto uh, area. And in many ways, it's this, it's this that uh, changes the course of history. And what this is, is a transformer, excuse me, a transistor even. <laughs> it's a transistor. The transistor technology, which miniaturized switches, like on and off switches, and when you combine lots and lots of on and off switches, you get computers, uh, the transistor was the game changer. And lots of innovation and lots of money was sunk into uh, this work um, over here um, in the Bay Area, just south of San Francisco. Um, it was found that transistors worked really well using uh, the element silicon. And so uh, later on, this area, because of its focus on the transistor, became known as uh, Silicon uh, Valley. Um, <clears throat> and and, and uh, who can doubt how small uh, chips, which are really uh, the, the way in which transistors manifest on our smartphones and computers, who can doubt the degree to which uh, these chips have changed every aspect of humanity, even to today. And in fact, we continue to have uh, um, innovation and change uh, in, in the third industrial revolution, which really is that um, information technology revolution. And, you know, it started in the 1950s. I would argue it's still ongoing. You know, we're 70 years into it. Um, and, you know, we, we, it included things like the emergence of the internet and the personal computer and smartphones, of course, and social media. And, but something else is happening. Um, as we progress through that third industrial revolution, there appears to be something um, that's, that has the potential to be bigger and more transformational. Now, every time the world went into an industrial revolution, the world on the other side was very different. The world before the first industrial revolution, before steam and railways, um, and, and, and even sort of the basic factories of, of mass production, um, that was a very different world than the one uh, 80, 90, 100 years later on the other side of it. And so as we enter each of these and progress through them, uh, we can now anticipate uh, with, with some certainty that the other side of this revolution, uh, the world will look different. And each one of them has been more transformational. Uh, the world before computers and electronics and the internet. Imagine that world relative to the world we have today. We can't even imagine an, uh, uh, an unconnected world. And um, it really has been quite transformational. Now, 
I've been in this uh, technology industry almost 30 years, and I've been following a lots of trends. And over the last two or three years, I've noticed that things have been fairly, uh, uh, I, and I think you might agree, disruptive and uncertain. And, and I mean, really just in the last four to five years, I felt, what's going on? There's so much change at the technological level, the societal level. You know, you look at the, the global events and you wonder what's going on. What is the pattern? And I've spent a career looking for what we call signals and the noise, right? Looking for these patterns. Um, and I believe, as does the World Economic Forum and some other uh, researchers, scientists and, and, and uh, other analysts, that we are we, we have now the definition uh, the divine, maybe I should say this, the defining characteristics of a fourth, a fourth industrial revolution. And, and, and what are those? Well, there, I'll sort of narrow it down to four elements this morning in, in my brief talk. Um, the first is that what happens in the fourth industrial revolution has an enormous scope, enormous scope. That means that when new technology or new ideas or new products and services are introduced, um, they don't just roll out to a city or a region or even a country. They go global. They go global almost uh, on day one. You think about, for example, when we uh, had commercial airlines, uh, how long did it take for 50 million people to experience a commercial airline? And it's around 75 years. You know, you think about um, the introduction, introduction of the smartphone. How long did it take for 50 million people to experience the smartphone? It would take about 12 years. And then you fast forward to today and a new, a new solution comes out like Pokemon Go, this popular game. How long did it take to roll out to 50 million people? Just a few days, right? So uh, the, the ability for products to uh, proliferate quickly on a global basis uh, is part of the nature of the fourth industrial revolution. And that means there's lots of impact, which is a second characteristic. Um, let me talk about good and bad impact. If you're a software developer today and you uh, deploy software, think about uh, the recently announced uh, Apple iOS version 14, which was announced this week. That will get deployed eventually to over a billion devices very quickly, you know, within a, within a few weeks, and it'll be global, right? Now, people are looking forward to it. They're very excited. That's a, so the impact is great. They have new capabilities, new health apps <laughs> for their for their phones and their smartwatches, um, a whole range of new capabilities. But imagine if bad code is distributed. That bad code is distributed over the air to billions of people all around the world very quickly. And that can have massive impact. In, in Silicon Valley, we worry about that a lot because we're deploying software constantly and it's deploying to hundreds of millions and sometimes billions of devices. Oops. The uh, next of the four dimensions is the speed, the speed at which stuff is happening. And, and this is so intuitive, I almost don't need to talk about it, right? How fast uh, does the next smartphone come out or the next upgrade or the next new idea? It just seems to be happening and it is, you know, based on data, happening faster. And finally, this notion of convergence. So really quick, what is convergence? I mean, let's look at something like artificial intelligence. Clearly, that's a big deal, and we're all hearing a lot about it. It's moving quickly. It has all the characteristics of a fourth industrial revolution technology. The scope is massive. The impact and the speed is, is, are all of a magnitude we haven't seen in any prior revolutions. <clears throat> but what happens if we take AI and we add it to something else? Like, what happens if we take AI plus blockchain, for example? What does that equal? Or what happens when we take AI plus cars, AI plus transportation equals. So we have this idea of AI plus X equals. Um, and you can do that with any new technology. You can take something like uh, augmented reality plus X equals. And you can even make it more complicated. You say AI plus augmented reality plus blockchain plus X equals. And when we start to do that, which is very common now within the fourth industrial revolution, um, the, the, the type of innovation that will, be, will emerge will be significant. <clears throat> uh, of course, there's an industrial component. We're seeing the introduction of robots. Um, in this particular picture, what's interesting are two things. Um, first, where are the humans? <laughs> um, there's actually two people in this picture. Um, I, I, with some of my students, we have a lot of fun trying to find the people. 
Um, but these robots are, are taking basically raw materials on one end of the factory and, and spitting out fully completed cars on the other. And uh, it's running 24 hours a day. So, you know, it can't stop. So this, this production line has predictive technology that helps the uh, systems anticipate issues that might happen. Um, and, and that's good because if, if something breaks down that you don't know about, it's actually more costly and it takes more time than if you can anticipate the issue. And the second characteristic of this picture is that if there is an issue, if something does go wrong, uh, the robots will fix it themselves. The robots will fix it themselves. That's a pretty big deal. Um, new tools are being introduced for uh, people to be, to be able to uh, render complete solutions uh, digitally before they ever build them the concept of digital twins and in fact digital twins is becoming a major component of car design and manufacturer so we could have a uh, we can build a car uh, on some sort of computer-aided design platform um, and uh, we've been able to do that for a while sure but we can build that car then we can run it through any type of simulation you know different weather uh, different road conditions uh, and gather data you know, when we start to design the prototype, we can we can cover it in sensors, and then we can collect real data uh, from that physical prototype and have it uh, exposed through a digital twin, a digital replica, and be able to design the most beautiful, you know, efficient and reliable cars. And and so it's a very big part of the automotive uh, industry. Uh, so no doubt, as society changes, and we see these dimensions of scope, impact, velocity, convergence. Um, how will it manifest in our world uh, beyond just the introduction of new services and products? Um, well, cities have become the uh, center of the human experience. Um, and the growth and the uh, evolution of cities, again, is another characteristic uh, of the fourth industrial revolution. Um, just in 2008, the majority of humans shifted from being rural to being urban. So we went from... Uh, approximately 3.6 or 7 billion humans um, living in a, uh, a, a, a more than three and a half a billion in the rural to now the uh, majority in a in a in, in an urban area, uh, and that's accelerating. We have about three million people moving into cities every single week, every single week. And by the way, we'll build infrastructure, which is about the size of Manhattan. You know, infrastructure the size of New York City every month for the next 40 years. Um, so cities um, are the most complex and most successful of human inventions. And for the last few decades, we've built our cities around cars. We built cities for cars. And sure, it, 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 the, the positive side has been enormous, but clearly there's been a downside too. Our cities aren't great for people anymore. Um, cars dominate the cityscape in terms of roads and, and parking um, and, and danger uh, and even pollution and, and impacts on climate change. Um, so, so cities are ripe for change, as are uh, the way in which we move humans in our cities. And this is going to be a major characteristic, firstly, of the 21st century, but also the fourth uh, industrial revolution. Um, so uh, what I'd like to do is touch on what I believe to be some of the, the, the key changes here just in the next few years. Now, some have said that the emergence of the autonomous vehicle um, is, is going to be the most impactful innovation of the first 50 years of the 21st century. Um, it could well be true. It's certainly in, in my research and experiences, um, when cars and all sorts of transportation drives itself, um, you can begin to rethink a lot of things. Um, you can basically redesign cities because no longer are we building cities for humans who need to drive cars in those cities. For example, traffic signals or lanes um, or parking facilities, uh, directional signs. A whole number of things change our thinking because of autonomy. Um, and so... Uh, the emergence of autonomous vehicles, which I believe are coming. You're probably already a convinced audience. I don't have to convince you. Um, uh, but many people are, are doubtful, I think, still. And here in Silicon Valley, we have a lot of organizations super focused on this science. 
Um, I've personally experienced several autonomous vehicles, and I'm convinced just through my own personal experience that this is going to be, be a big deal. Our cars are going to be electric, and we may not even own cars um, by the time we get to the middle uh, and beyond of this of this century. Uh, we may get to a completely on-demand model, which changes the automotive uh, landscape too. We go from a seller market to more of a, uh, a lease or rental type of environment. Um, here's just some quick data because we love data in our presentations. Um, you know, what, what is the economic impact of going to autonomous vehicles? Um, and this is some work done by the consulting group McKinsey. Um, you know, maybe uh, it's conservative, maybe it's excessive, but uh, based on their science, they uh, say, you can see here, almost close to a trillion dollar benefit um, by 2030, which is only now uh, nine and a half years ago, uh, nine and a half years to go, um, uh, impacted by autonomous uh, vehicles. Um, there's no question that cars have largely become very sophisticated computers on wheels. Uh, I mean, we've pushed the innovation around uh, engine efficiency and aerodynamics. Um, uh, our cars are, are, are pretty efficient, particularly the, the new ones coming off the production lines today. Um, but they are uh, super focusing on, on a better experience, more features. And many of those features are, are technology uh, driven. Our, our, our cars are becoming incredible computing devices on wheels. Um, in, in, in one of the more sort of unusual um, directions to, that cars are, are, are taking is a car as a payment device. So car as a payment device. And you see companies like Visa and MasterCard um, embedding their technology within cars so that the car, man, the car becomes a payment. So whether you drive, drive into a retail store or a gas station, the car will pay and take care of the transaction. So we're getting to a point where we have to think about cars differently. Um, of course, we're moving. It looks like uh, the trend suggests to electric cars. The combustion engine uh, may start to wind down uh, over the next few decades. Uh, in some countries, it's the laws, you know, by, by 2035, no more combustion engine cars sold. I think in India, it's 2045. Uh, some pretty aggressive schedules to get there. One of the problems with electric cars today, and one of the reasons we're concerned, is that uh, batteries are expensive, and we still can't go uh, as far as we want, particularly in the in the lower cost vehicles. Um, we're going to see that innovation happen. We're going to see very uh, low cost uh, batteries, and we're going to see see much more extended um, uh, trips. Um, in fact, uh, I'm particularly intrigued by this innovation. Um, this is a company called um, uh, Lightyear. Uh, Lightyear is based out of uh, the Netherlands, or Holland. And what I love about Lightyear is that their car is completely solar driven. You don't have to plug this thing in, right? So th this is having, this is like the, you, you will uh, potentially own a car uh, that you never have to pay any energy for. It just gets its energy from that wonderful big star in the sky every day um, and can run uh, unlimited at no, effectively uh, no cost. I think that's the kind of groundbreaking innovation uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see. Um, and just going back to this notion of on demand, um, this concept now of mobility as a service is beginning to pick up speed. Now, this is where, let's say, um, after this uh, call today, this conference, uh, I want to go to, um, you know, to a store, um, a, a, a COVID protected store. Um, and I didn't want to use my car. How could I get there? I could spin up my my MAS app, my mobile mobility service app, and it would tell me where do you want to go, and it would give me an optimized trip uh, that uses a multitude of transportation. It might say, why don't you cycle to the train station, um, you know, take the train to the next stop, and then maybe that last mile you can use an on-demand uh, car service. Um, so it's a way of um, leveraging um, disparate communicate uh, transportation uh, mechanisms um, that have a lower, you know, carbon footprint, a lower cost, um, and have some efficiency, and and also talks to this idea of a, a car, a, a world where we don't um, have cars. Um, transportation is shifting, as you know. You just have to look at the the city landscape and notice many, many different forms of transportation. 
Um, and now we live in an era, the fourth industrial revolutions allow us, allows us to think really big. Um, I never thought that in my lifetime um, I would see uh, flying cars. Uh, it seems like something from science fiction and comic books and, and uh, TV cartoons. Um, but I am an investor in a flying car company, um, and it's coming. Um, it'll be a little while to make it uh, cost effective and, and, and get the technology where it needs to be. Um, but it, we have all the indications that um, autonomous electric uh, flying vehicles uh, are eventually going to come. We really need to be thinking big about the future of transportation and how we move humans and products. Um, maybe Hyperloop for some people seems crazy, but at least it's a starting point in terms of how we think about uh, major shifts. Um, uh, Hyperloop is probably going to happen in some places, but is it scalable? Can we get it to a point where it is effective? And might car companies become investors and innovators in these alternative transports? I think the evidence suggests it certainly will. Um, lastly, my last comment here before I wrap up, uh, major comment, is that uh, we're also pedestrianizing our cities. It's good for people, it's good for health, it's good for walking, uh, it's good for the environment. Um, and, it's, and it's happening on a global basis, this pedestrianization of the city center. Um, so that in, its, in of itself changes uh, how we need to think about um, uh, driving and, and where we park and, and when we use our cars. Uh, the biggest phenomena of the fourth industrial revolution will not be technology or ideas. It'll be the impact of climate change on our planet, because this is the existential question. How do we solve the major uh, shifts in our um, uh, long-term weather patterns and the climate of the planet. Um, and it will impact our infrastructure, it will impact our roads as we have uh, more deadly storms and flooding. Um, so we can't talk about the fourth industrial revolution without recognizing the significant impact of our climate crisis and what we do about it. Um, so we are entering a time of great change. It's not lost in any of you. Uh, it really doesn't matter what industry you're in today. Um, the fourth industrial revolution, digital transformation, different human expectations are all shifting um, the needs of the marketplace. And the biggest threat, the biggest threat I would say to the automotive industry, because this is the audience today, is relevancy. You know, will you be relevant next week and next year and 10 years from now? I think every C-suite has to be talking about relevancy uh, as often as possible. Now, I just want to wrap up and say, um, if you enjoyed my talk and you're curious about all these topics, um, I've written a book about it. I've written a bestseller. This is number one right now on Amazon in several categories. Um, I'm super excited about writing it and being able to put a lot of my thoughts uh, in one um, book called Smart Cities for Dummies. Uh, it, it talks a lot about transportation, talks a lot about the future, gives a real uh, guidebook on what to do next, um, how you can manage the fourth industrial revolution, what it means to your, your family, your friends, your children, your parents, um, and your organization. So uh, if you would like, uh, you can go to smartcitybook.com, um, purchase it on Amazon. If you're looking at this video um, primarily from the UK or Europe, um, it is available, for example, on waterstones.com. Uh, and, and other local uh, bookstores. Um, and with that, I'd like to say thank you very much for this privilege. Um, and Peter, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. That was interesting. And, and everyone out there, buy the book. Um, it will cover everything you need. And it, it was a, a, a pleasure to listen to it all. I think the whole, for me, uh, moving forward, the design and development of cities to become a more pleasurable experience to go to, um, where you can breathe without all the appropriate car fumes, and generally sort of not want to sort of go in and then, then literally uh, leap out. How far away from that do you think we are? Well, to make it really, well, to make it really relevant, uh, you know, our, our global pandemic, our little friend that's with us for a while, is actually accelerating innovation. I think we see that. This conference is an example of that. 
And COVID is also accelerating ideas that cities have been playing with for a while but never acted on. For example, um, because more people are out cycling right now and more people are walking, many cities around the world are converting uh, entire roads and but mostly lanes into walking areas. You're seeing this in in New York and Los Angeles. You're seeing this in in London, in fact. You're seeing it in Paris and, and cities all over the world. Um, so uh, you know if there if there is any type of uh, silver lining on this on this horrible horrible pandemic, um, it is that you know organizations and cities are being forced to move more quickly with some of their ideas. So I think we'll see uh, much greater pedestrianization, as I've spoken about. Um, there's some really amazing work being done, for example, in Mexico City to basically uh, remove roads and, and put uh, lawns down, put, put uh, grass and, and, uh, and, and make, uh, you know, big boulevards into places where people go um, to have picnics and to, to walk and to, to get away from the craziness. So this phenomena of sort of conversion of the concrete jungle into you know, grassy areas is, is a global phenomenon it's, and it's starting to happen. And, and you asked how long? It'll take a while. The, these things, uh, you know, just the the work to do, to get the permission and then to do the work takes takes a few years. But, you know, it's all within the next decade in terms of some major changes. The second area is in this idea of urban forests, urban forests. So I don't know if you've noticed, but in, in, in many nice uh, progressive cities in the world, you're seeing a lot more trees. Um, there's some real efforts being made to to plant more trees and it's been done for lots of reasons first of all trees are beautiful i hope nobody would argue that <laughs> you know big trees uh anywhere are, are just wonderful but they're also amazing for our health right and, and they are sort of the lungs of the planet um and so if you have as you talked about you know car fumes in in our cities and which we do unfortunately to to too much of a degree um, planting many many more trees can help in the short term with absorbing some of that um, those toxins um, planting trees and, and creating urban forests in our cities also cools our cities um, and so you know you have a a, a, a big um, parking lot um, that sort of turns into what we call a sort of heat island you know on, on a you're going to have a a very sunny day there in London today, I believe, very hot sunny day. And so there, you know, the city's gonna heat up and that heat, you know, is going to um, raise the temperature of the, uh, of, the, of the air. And, um, you know, it doesn't help with, um, with health or nor does it, does it help with um, raising the temperature of the climate. Um, so planting trees actually reduces the temperature of these, these heat islands as we call them. Um, finally, um, we're, we're going to see cities deploy uh, more sensors um, using technology uh, uh, based on the Internet of Things. So these little devices that can sense things and then report that data back to a cloud service, a collection service. Um, and what those sensors will do is check the quality of air. Uh, they'll check for noise. They'll check. Um, uh, uh, they'll do things like count the traffic and the type of traffic. Um, and, and, and why that's important is because people, when they have data, make more informed choices um, about you know, innovation and what they do, but also about who they vote for. Um, so that'll also be a, a catalyst for change, for positive change uh, it, over the next uh, five to 10 years as well, uh, hopefully making our cities uh, healthier and more beautiful, better places to live. On the, uh, the the health subject was at the moment. Sure. How much change do you think we really need to make uh, to make the mobility as a service platform or, or public transportation a cleaner and a more um, less likelihood of, of sort of being infected because of the volumes of people? Is that something that we've got to really look at from design stage, design stage? Yeah, no, no, no doubt. I, I mean, I always think, I believe, this is my opinion, that the marketplace is, is one of the best catalysts for change. For example, if someone doesn't like something, they shouldn't buy it. And, and, and that's, that's a way of voting with your wallet. Um, and so, it, you know, if something's not in demand, a producer won't make it. Um, so there, there seems to be a, a changing consumer um, 
as I mentioned right now, <clears throat> we have quite a lot of evidence that a new generation of uh, consumers, whether uh, I think millennials now are, are kind of moving uh, uh, to be older and older, we, we're, we're now faced with uh, Generation Y and Generation Next and Generation Z. And, and these people, for example, are, are, are definitely um, uh, creating change because it, it's been reflected in their buying patterns. Um, they're much, they appear to be much more concerned with the planet. Uh, they appear to be um, more concerned with uh, responsible organizations. Um, and they don't seem to be too keen on cars, um, at least owning cars. I mean, they like traveling in cars, but not, so, not necessarily owning them. Um, so it seems to me that mobility as a service will, will be driven, literally, um, by uh, consumer, emerging consumer uh, demands. And, and that will really um, push the speed and the level of innovation. Um, you know, you, you can look at an example of, for example, Finland, uh, where mobility as a service is much more mature than probably a lot of places. Um, that, that was driven not only by, you know, um, uh, just great innovation, but the Finnish uh, population have been demanding uh, cleaner, more efficient uh, forms of public transportation. That has really made uh, mobility as a service uh, take off in a big way. Um, and other communities are recognizing that and, and beginning to uh, to experiment and gradually adopt it. Um, it it's, it's in various states all, all over the world. Um, but I do see, based on the evidence, uh, that uh, mobility as a service will offer lots of options for people, will drive more um, eco-efficient uh, transportation and public transportation. And it is something that I think we'll see uh, on, on a broad scale in this decade. Excellent. I uh, really appreciate you joining us, uh, and especially as it's, it was very, very early for you when you started, <laughs> really. And, uh, but I'm sure sort of um, from the feedback, uh, you've got a lot of uh, benefit from the, um, uh, your presentation as well, because we certainly have, so we, we hope you will. And um, don't forget, everyone, um, have a look at the book, buy the book. Yeah, it, it's something that we're all going to be changing into as we move forward. And I think the whole aspect of a, a smarter, cleaner, more environmentally friendly city environment is what we need to have. So thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, everybody, for uh, joining us today. Uh, tomorrow, we have a mixture of um, a sort of presentations, keynotes, um, uh, startup uh, opportunities, which you touched on earlier as well, because startups are really going to uh, think there isn't a box anymore. Because all this, ex, you know, let's sort of think out of the box. Well, I think everybody's got rid of the box, so that we can really look at uh, a clean and a, and a greener sheet to be able to sort of design with. So, um, thank you, um, thank you, everyone. Um, let's all keep safe and. Uh, Hopefully, Jonathan, we'll see you um, a little bit closer than the few thousand miles next time. Take care. I All hope. the best. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.